Hi, everybody, and welcome to Adoption Air, Voice of Adoption. We, are, we welcome to Professor Joyce McGuire Pavao, um, and we want to thank her for accepting our invitation to talk today. Hi, Joyce. Hi, thank you very much for having me. I, 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 my daughter lives upstairs, and I was visiting her, and I said, oh, bye, I have to go to Italy. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> There's <always> connection. <laughs> Great. So, um, Professor Pavao, uh, she's uh, one of the most um, expert in the, the adoption field uh, in the world because she has a lot of experience and she founded uh, um, the uh, Center of Adoption in um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, in the US. Um, and then she is lecturer of um, university. Uh, her um, resume, her uh, curriculum is uh, huge. So I just <laughs> want to say a little thing. We both, her book five years ago, which is um, only one, unfortunately so far, and uh, is The Family of Adoption, which is uh, really amazing. Um, so we would like to ask her uh, some questions. But if you want to um, tell us uh, something about you and your job, uh, so just to, be, to begin. Okay. Um, well, I'm adopted. And I think that's very, very important because any professional who works in adoption, it's very important to know where they're coming from. And I feel very... Uh, I don't know, I feel gifted in that as an adopted person, I've been able to stay central because the adoptee is the centerpiece. You wouldn't have adoption if you didn't have adoptees. So although I have great empathy and care for birth parents and adoptive parents, adoptees are the ones who we must keep in the center and work with. So that's been my my focus over the years. I'm very old. That's why I have a long resume. Um, but the, <laughs> the, so that means I've been around for a long time. And when I started, um, I went to Harvard University. Um, one, because it was in Cambridge and I didn't want to move. And two, because it has a worldwide reputation. And the work I was doing, no one quite believed in people would say to me, you can't study adoption. There's no such thing. And this was in the 1970s. And so when I was at Harvard and I was studying adoption and the psychology of adoption, professors would say to me, Joyce, that, that's, that isn't a thing. And I would say, oh, yes, it is. I, I live it and it is a thing and I want to study it. And so I did. So I have uh, started many clinics um, over the years and one of the longest lived ones was called the Center for Family Connections. And it was a mental health clinic that was designed specifically for adoption and complex blended families through kinship, foster care, donor, surrogacy, all the, all the things that make a family in a slightly different way. And um, the thing that was unique about it it was the only place in the country, in the United States at the time, that had nothing to do with the placement agency. Most of the clinics and places that provide services to all of the parties in adoption are also placement agencies. So they have a bit of a conflict of interest, whether they mean to or not. And it felt to me like we needed a very a pure place that only dealt with these issues without being about placement. So it was very unique in that way. There were many things that were unique about it. It was, uh, you know, the, the models for treatment that we developed were unique and the models for training were unique. And we had, in the end, we had about 17 therapists and then we had interns from very different walks of life. We had psychology, psychiatry, social work, marriage and family therapy, uh, expressive therapies. Um, and all of these people, you know, they were drawn to the work, usually because they had some personal connection to adoption, but not always. And um, 
it was a wonderful opportunity to really work with each other to talk about how we would approach a case, especially from our point of view. Um, because people people can't be totally objective. They're always somewhat subjective. So it was important to do that. So it was very sad when the clinic closed because of funding issues and other things that were happening in the world uh, in 2012. But I've continued to do the work and to do a lot of consulting and supervision to therapists all over the world. And um, I still do work with families and individuals. Um, so in a nutshell, and I, I'm on the faculty of Harvard Medical School as a lecturer in psychiatry, and it's another opportunity. I always say it's like auditioning. I get to train the um, child and adult psychiatrists as they come through, and I give them some information about adoption and some awareness. And I, I call it auditioning because I can tell which ones really get it. This year, I have a, a young child psychiatry resident who is very interested in transracial adoption. Uh, she doesn't have a personal connection to it. She's African-American. And so she's going to come and study with me. She got a grant to come and study with me for six months. And so I, I love those opportunities because you get to give someone an understanding of us, the world of adoption, uh, when they might not otherwise have had it. And I think we get pathologized uh, a lot, especially by the medical community and the mental health community. And um, I've always tried to shift that, that uh, really there's something very normal under the circumstances of adoption that sometimes looks like it isn't normal to the rest of the world. So anyway, I've, I've blabbed on enough. <laughs> so that's that's just a little bit about who I am and what I do. And um, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Yeah. Um, the, the first question that I actually that pop up now that I'm talking about this, uh, your activity then, um, as a psych psychiatrist, um, can you tell us... Um, I'm not a oh, yeah. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm a psychologist, family therapist, and social worker. But I'm not a psychiatrist. Okay. I'm a lecturer in psychiatry at the medical school. But based on your activity and your experience, can we can adoptees can be defined as a mm, traumatized people? Absolutely, absolutely. And be you know, this is something that I've always said. And now it's, now it's much more comfortable and understood in the world. But when I would first say this, people thought I was pathologizing. That, you know, my whole work was not to pathologize adoptees, yet I was saying they were traumatized. So, I, it, you know, I would get lots of flack for this. And I would say, no, 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 I, it, it's, you know, it's an experience that you come into the world with and it, it shapes how you are. And there may be cumulative uh, traumas. You may have additional traumas as you go along, but the first trauma is the separation from your birth mother, from your family. And uh, so we, we can suffer um, of uh, PTSD, right? Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And it, it comes in different waves and in different forms, but it can often be misdiagnosed. I mean, for me, in the 1980s, there was not one adopted person or foster child that wasn't diagnosed as ADHD. Every single diagnosis was that they had attention deficit, hyperactive. Um, and that wasn't true. First of all, you can't have a whole cohort with the exact same diagnosis in that way. Um, second of all, some of the some of the categories that define ADHD are exactly the same as PTSD. And I think it's important to be sure you're diagnosing someone correctly because if they don't have the right diagnosis, they can't have the right treatment. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's start with... Uh, okay. Uh, um, according to your long experience, uh, 
um, how adoption uh, has changed in these years? <sighs> That's a big question. Um, <laughs> it, it, it definitely has changed, but it not enough for my liking. Um, I, I, I think that awareness has come about. It was, um, from my vision, it was the 1970s, uh, the 60s and 70s, when people started speaking out. That was the women's movement, the civil rights movement. There were lots of movements. And very quietly, um, under the radar, was the adoption reform movement. And in that time, adopted people who had been adopted in the 40s and 50s uh, were now reaching adulthood and had something to say and they were speaking out, which was unusual. And birth parents were, you know, there was a group called CUB, Concerned United Birth Parents, started in the United States and birth parents band together. And adoptees began to meet together and to talk. And it was at that time that an awareness, and you know, one of the, the things about being critical or, or saying what's wrong, because really you were supposed to say how wonderful adoption was, how, how grateful you were to have a family because your first family didn't work out for some reason. And you should be very grateful and you should appreciate adoption. And that was the message from society. Um, and that's true. Uh, I, I think many adoptees, not every adoptee had a healthy, good family that adopted them, but many, many, many families had very good lives and upbringings in their adoptive family. But that doesn't discount the fact that they were missing a major portion of who they were and what was going on. So when you spoke out about adoption needing some reform, you were immediately called anti-adoption and uh, people thought you were against adoption. And having run clinics for 45 years, um, I have to say that there are and always will be situations where adoption is important and necessary. There are often situations where children need a family and their own birth family or extended family are not able or available to do that. So I don't think adoption should be canceled, but I do think it should be reformed. I think there should never be a closed adoption. There should always be a connection to the birth family and availability for ongoing information and transfer of knowledge between the two families for the child. Um, I think that, you know, if you had transparency and uh, acceptance and integration, I, I always give the example of, I love the Hawaiian rituals. Um, I once did a conference in Hawaii and uh, I, I was a keynote speaker along with a native Hawaiian who was also adopted. And in that country, in that state, um, what they do is their ancient culture is called Hanai and they used to only do open adoptions and they were they were planned. It was like marriage. It was how two families came together to to expand each other and to improve their resources and everything else. So this gentleman got up to speak at the conference and he played the drums and chanted. And it was amazing. It was this beautiful chanting and drumming in Hawaii. I mean, it was gorgeous. And at the end of it, he said, I'm the vessel that holds two families. I'm hanai which means I'm adopted. And so what I chanted for you was the lineage of my birth family and the lineage of my adoptive family. And I'm the vessel that holds those two families. And it's a very important role. And I just stood there and said, I have to go next um, because I had to speak next. And to me, that was beautiful. I mean, adoptees when I was growing up and even now are not celebrated for being something of importance in both families. They're actually, oh, how come your uh, upper family didn't keep you? What was wrong with you? I mean, people have very negative and weird responses sometimes when you tell them you're adopted but not in Hawaii. In Hawaii, it's a, a wonderful thing. And it gives you the opportunity to bring two families together and to hold them together. 
Um, so what, what I would like to see that kind of culture in adoption when it's necessary. And adoption should never be done when it's not necessary. I think that a lot of even domestic adoptions that are done with the best intentions are still sort of like child trafficking. If you're coercing the birth family and you're pushing things in a certain direction. And I, I also think that poverty is no reason to remove a child. We're gonna see a lot more of this in the world after this virus. Um, we're, we're gonna see way too many families split up and way too much poverty. It's gonna be how it is in the coming years. And there aren't going to be enough families with any resources to adopt. So we're going to have to help families to stay together and to keep their, their families together and to figure out how to proceed. Uh, and I think this is a good point in time because I've, th I've seen things improve and then go back and then improve and then go back. I think this terrible pandemic it could actually be a way to shift many things, the climate, the way we look at family, the connections. Um, I think it, it may end up being, uh, there may end up being a silver lining. And I certainly hope so. Um, Matt, I wanted yeah. to say two things about the, this uh, quarantine that we're all in. Uh, I've, yes, been do I've been doing teleconferencing with a lot of my clients. And um, so I've had a chance to get a weekly sense of how people are doing and what's going on for them. And there are some huge triggers that I keep seeing. I spoke with a birth mother last week who just met her birth son for the first time. He's 30. And um, she is having a hard time because he's not, you know, wanting to talk to her all the time. He's, he's, he's you know, connecting but his pacing is very different than what she wants. So I started to ask her what her experience was like when she had him. And she was only 15 years old when she had him. So basically when you're 15 and you place a child for adoption, you're not placing a child for adoption. Your parents and the adults are. You're not really given any choice. So it was important for her to begin to forgive herself but one of the things she told me, she told me that she was very triggered since this quarantine. And the reason is when she was 15, her parents put her in her room for five months and uh, a friend would bring her homework, but leave it at the door. They said she had some, you know, mono or some disease and no one could come into the house. Um, so she was, the only other time she was ever quarantined in her life was during her pregnancy. So she's been, it's been very, very hard for her because it, it just, you know, brings up so much. And then I have three adult adoptees who are in college, 20, 22, 23 year old adoptees. Two were adopted from Russia to the United States. And uh, one was adopted from Colombia to the United States. And all three of them had the same weird experience. When the college is closed, they gave three to five days notice for everyone to pack up and leave. And I knew this was very, I mean, obviously that's a very crazy and hard thing to do. You're in the middle of your, your college and, and you're, you know, all of a sudden disrupted. But, um, you know, and I, I'm, an inter, I'm a host family to international students. So I had students um, from all over the world at the law school at Harvard who had to pack up and leave. And it was crazy, it was just crazy. So these three, I'll, I'll tell you about one, one of the Russian adoptees. He, he was just so anxious and having such a hard time when he got home that he didn't come out of his room at all. And his parents called and said, he's an adult, so we can't do anything, but could you try to email him or something? We know he's, he sees you sometimes and he hasn't been seeing you since he's been in college. So when I spoke to him, I suggested that maybe this was bringing up feelings for him because the last time he was abruptly moved and transferred was when he was adopted. And he was taken at very short, no notice to him. He didn't, no one explained anything. And he was put in a plane and brought to the United States and he was in a whole other place with different, different, everything different. 
and lost all his family and his friends from the orphanage. And this was a, a replica of that. And it was really bringing up some very, very hard traumas and feelings for him. So I, I think we don't understand. And then all of my young adoptees, um, I have one that I'm going to speak to today. His birth mother's from Puerto Rico. And um, he wants to know if she's okay. They have a closed adoption, but he can't stop thinking if his birth family is okay. And every adoptee, wherever in the world their parents, birth parents are, are thinking something about that. Because this is, this is the only time we've ever had this kind of a worldwide pandemic. So it, it brings up so much for so many people. Yeah. Yes. Right. Well, Agreed. there is a, um, a question. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes. Um, uh, someone ask, uh, ask you if you can better name the term pathologizing. I'm sorry, I'm, uh, you're, the sound fell off there. Could you repeat it? Okay. Yeah. Um, someone asked you if you can explain the term pathologizing. Okay. Um, when uh, it's a medical term, a pathology is, is illness, uh, you know, something that has to be taken out and, um, you know, has to be cured, has to be changed. Um, and I think that many times uh, the medical model is one that tries to figure out what the pathology is. What's, what's wrong with the patient, you know? And in the case of adoption, I think people over pathologize. They, they think everything is wrong with us. And in fact, sometimes it's the system that's wrong. It's what's being done uh, to not explain or not help us to understand. And, and people not listening to adoptees, not hearing what's real for them. Uh, it's, you know, a lot of young adoptees lie a lot and their parents come in and they say, oh, you know, Dr. Pavel, my son lies all the time. What are we going to do? And then I meet with him and he's lived in a fantasy world his whole life. He's nine years old and he, no one's told him the truth about his birth family. He doesn't know any of the stories he needs to know to make sense of himself. So he makes them up. He makes things up all the time. And he also lies when he does something bad and he doesn't want to get caught because he's afraid he'll get rejected. So a lot of adoptee behaviors, if you understand and if you listen, you can help to cure them. You can help to change that. But it's not because they are sick. It's because there's something not happening to give them what they need in order to feel whole. I hope okay. that I hope that answers it. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. And there's another question that I would like to ask you um, about um, yeah school. Since we are talking about school, um, school is a very uh, particular and important topic for adoptees. I mean, for everybody, but for adoptees, uh, just take an important part of, of uh, our life. Um, and it seems that the focus is uh, for adopters and teachers is uh, um, only on uh, learning disorders. And so that's on the performances that adopters have. Um, how do you think trauma affected uh, adoptive school life uh, and in which, uh, in which way mostly? Well, I think... Uh, I, I like to I like to tell long stories to get to the point. So bear with me. Um, I think that school is a very important transition for people. Before you go to school, only your family feeds you information and knowledge and takes care of you, um, your family and your caregivers and your extended family. And then all of a sudden you're in school, which is you know run in a very different way and uh, with teachers and, you know, other people in your life. And it's when you get to school as an adoptee that people ask you questions that you don't have the answers to. Um, you know, little children will say, they'll find out that you're adopted and they'll say, why are you adopted? What happened? 
And part of it's mean. Some kids may be being mean, but a lot of it is just worry. Because if you got adopted, I might get adopted. And what does that mean? I mean, I, you know, some kids want to. They're very unhappy with their family at this moment because they can't do this or they can't do that. And some kids just worry about it. So they're asking, you know, what happened? How did this happen to you? And you have no idea. And you don't know how to answer that. And so you may become belligerent or you may act out. And then you get a reputation for being, you know, aggressive or not behaving or something like that. So I think school is very complicated. And very early on, adoptees get pigeonholed. They get put into a little uh, box and they get they're experienced in certain ways. Now, when I was growing up, uh, almost all of the adoptees uh, of my era um, were white with white families. And so you didn't necessarily know that we were adopted. You, you know, we could pass as being a, a member of the family by birth. And so you, you had the, uh, the, the good thing about that was you had a good boundary. So you didn't have to tell everyone and not everyone knew. Um, but the bad thing about that was people pretended that you were born into that family and wouldn't tell you anything about your birth family or wouldn't acknowledge that you also had another family. When uh, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, the Korean adopted, in, I'm, I'm speaking of the United States because that's what I know the best, but it was after the Korean War that we started having uh, transracial adoption. We had Korean adoptees and we also had Colombian adoptees. And so we started having more uh, mixed transracial families. And at that point, it became very hard for those kids because they were instantly known as adoptees because you could see their parents dropping them off and you could see that they didn't look like their parents. Um, but they, you know, they weren't given the supports that they needed and they sort of had to be the ambassadors for transracial adoption when they, like the in-race adoptees of the decade before, didn't have any information. If you asked a question, they didn't have the answers. They had no idea what happened. Just one day they got in a plane and ended up in a new country. Uh, it's, you know, so I think in order to understand school-related problems, you have to understand that people need more information about what's going on for these kids. Um, th I'm going to jump around with this. There is so so many school related problems at different ages and stages of development. Um, if you have my uh, website, there are some good charts in there for stages of development and things of that sort. And in my book, there's a chapter on, on, um, on school. But I think um, what I would want to point out is that uh, kids need to have adults understand them and adults don't understand them. Um, and that really has been a problem because they don't have the equipment to talk about it themselves. And it really takes the adults doing it to make sense of it. When, when I ran my clinic, we started an adoptive parent group because the parents would be there in the waiting room while their kids were in therapy. And we finally said they needed some therapy too. So we put them all together and gave them an intern and gave them a book club and they had to read things and discuss things. And they became more and more knowledgeable, this group of parents, and they started an organization. And one of the things we helped them to do, and we trained them all the time, um, when a school, when you think a school needs help, and all of them do, to know about adoption, you send a different, like if your child goes to school A and your colleague and friend's child goes to school B, you don't want to go to school A and talk about adoption because you'll be seen as the parent who's being annoying and your child will be picked out of that school. So you send the parent from school B to give a talk at a teacher's meeting on adoption. And that person is unknown to this school. So they can be, you know, they can talk about it and they're not going to be, you know, sectioned out and, and told they're, you know, they're being overreactive. Um, so the more we can figure out ways to educate schools and the more we can understand what kids need, 
the better it will be. I, I, they're really suffering in many ways. When children are, are adopted internationally and they come here at an older age, or, or even when they're adopted uh, domestically at an older age, uh, they haven't had schooling in a traditional way and in a you know consecutive way. So when you put them in a grade that's their age grade, like if you put a six-year-old in the second grade, um, they're not going to do very well. They don't speak English yet, and they're, they don't have the foundation of learning. I think we go about this all wrong, and it ends up with the kids feeling there's something wrong with them and they're not smart enough, when in fact they just haven't been given the foundation that they need to move along. There has to be a different way of doing that and of giving them the supports they need. The other thing is most international adoptees who speak another language when they come learn English in our case very quickly. And, um, and they, they do, they're great speakers. They, they learn the language and they're fabulous, but they don't have the comprehension so they'll mm -hmm. pretend they understand things that they don't. And they don't get irony. So if someone is teasing them in a playful way, they'll think they're being mean and act out. So there's, there's a lot that gets lost in translation and there is no real understanding for that for these kids. It's a very different process. If you come to a country with your family of origin, and you all speak Italian and you come to the United States, um, you can learn English pretty quickly with your friends and your teachers, but you can go home and speak Italian and you can keep both of your languages and figure out how to sort them out. When you come here from Russia to the United States and you don't speak any English, um, when you learn English, you lose Russian. You don't have anyone speaking it to you every day and you begin to lose it. And when you lose your language, you lose your memories. Because the way that we work with, we have pictures in our head and we put words to them and those are called memories. When you lose your language, there's no words to go with the pictures. So it's a little scary if you have a vision of something and you don't have the words to put to it. So kids are going through a lot of trauma in different ways. And we just don't have enough attention paid to how complicated it is. And some of the learning disabilities aren't. Um, I, I always, I, I'm not much of a researcher, but I've always wanted someone to do this research. Um, kids who are adopted from Latin America and Central America to the United States. Across the board, I would say, I don't know, just 89%, a huge percentage of these kids have auditory processing problems. They don't learn and comprehend well from reading. They need to hear. So listening to books on tape and, and having stories told to them gives them more of an option to retain information. And to me, if that many people have that difficulty, it's not a learning disability, it's a teaching disability. You can't have that, if that many people have that issue, it's something that's very normal for them and it's their style of learning. It's not something pathological. It's not something negative. So I think throughout school, we don't give adopted people the best opportunities. We don't pay attention to their um, challenges that are real. And challenges don't have to be negative. Um, there, you can have challenges and work through them. It doesn't mean you're less than, it doesn't mean you're not smart. It just means you have a different style of learning and you need a different kind of support and teaching. That's a little tiny bit. Yeah, yeah we agree. <laughs> um. So in your academic career, have you encountered any obstacles or due to the fact that you are an adoptee? Uh, I, you, got, you got twisted a little. The, the sound sometimes gets funny. Could you repeat, Laura? Yeah, yeah. In your school and academic career, have you encountered any obstacle due to the fact that you are an adoptee? Yes and no. <clears throat> when, 
the interesting thing is when I started doing this, um, there were a lot of adoptees speaking out. I wasn't the only pioneer at all. There were plenty of adoptees speaking out and telling their story. But I did start the mental health movement in adoption. I, I started to pay attention to it in that way. Um, and I would often be asked to speak at conferences and to do trainings. And when I would do those, <coughs> many people liked that I was an adoptee. I can't tell you the number of people who have said, oh, you went to Harvard and you have your doctorate. We didn't think adoptees could do that. The, uh, many professionals and adopted parents don't have, they, they don't think that we can succeed in some ways. And it's a lot of it's because of what happened in school. A lot of it is how we were treated and what was going on in school. So I would have some people who loved me to speak because I would be their model for a good adoptee. And then other people would listen to what I said and they'd be more skeptical um, because mm -hmm. I was saying some things that they didn't want to hear. You know, there, there were some things that I said, and you know, we talked about this before we came on air, that um, a lot of people accuse you of being uh, anti-adoption if you have any critique or if you're trying to do anything to reform the world of adoption. So I've had plenty, I've been doing this for like, I forget, 45 years or something ridiculous way before you were born. And um, so I think that many people perceive what you're saying as negative and you're not for adoption if you you know, if you criticize it, but I think it needs to be criticized. There are so many things that are wrong with adoption. Um, and there are so many ways that it's done that aren't ethical and aren't in the best interest of the child. And, and that quote is very important. Um, I do a lot of expert witnessing in court cases and, uh, you know, they throw around the best interest of the child all the time. But I have found that the best interest of the child in court and in social services is usually the best interest of the child as it pertains to whichever adult you're representing. So if you're representing the birth parent, the best interest of the child is as it, as it pertains to the birth parent. And if you're representing the adoptive parent, it's the best interest as it pertains to the adoptive parent. Well, to me, you have to look at just the child. And the child will become an adult. You can't just look at a snapshot in time. You can't just look at one moment in that child's life. You have to think about what will be best for that child throughout their life. And you have to pay attention to the importance of connections. And, um, you know, I, my clinic and I did a, an amazing job of helping families to open closed adoptions. Um, there were only a couple of people in, the, in this country opening closed adoptions of minors. Uh, it was considered very scandalous. Um, but it was, to me, really important. If the parents really understood and joined and helped to do what was best for this child, it would benefit everyone. It, and it might be very hard. Often it is. Often it's, you know, very difficult to form those kinds of relationships. But if you truly love your child and want them to be whole, you want to do whatever you can to make that happen. So when I say something like that, there are people who immediately say, oh, see, she's not for adoption. She wants the child to go back to their birth family. Well, I've worked with plenty of very, very difficult cases where the child is never going back to the birth family. The birth mother's mental illness is so severe. The birth father is imprisoned for many years. They're not going back to their birth family. But that doesn't mean they shouldn't know about them and have some kind of information and connection, even in a difficult story. So that's, that's, that's where I go with this. Yes, thank you. And um, yeah, and um, what about um, the relation uh, with your peer professors? I mean, teachers at the academy, because maybe they could even tell you 
uh, or told you that you are too biased, too involved into adoption and talking about adoption, right? Because yes. I I know many people who uh, who are in the same situation. So I would also like ask to you. The funny thing, Kim, is the people who have done that to me um, will have said exactly that. You're too biased. You're an adoptee. You can't look at this objectively. Our adoptive parents and professors. So I have turned right around and said to them, really, you think I'm biased? Um, uh, let's say, I, I think we're all biased and I think we need to look at this very carefully and maybe we need to come together and talk it out with all of us. Maybe we need to get a birth parent. And, and we used to do this at our clinic. We used to have what we called fish bowls. We would put an adoptive parent, a birth parent and an adoptee therapist in the middle of the fishbowl. And then the reflective team, all the rest of the staff and the interns would be on the outside or behind a one-way mirror. And we would have a conversation about a case. We got a case about an a adoptee and a, and a family, adoptive family, and the child wanted to know who the bird family was and should we help the child to know more or not. That was, that was the, uh, you know, the intake. And so we asked each of those professionals how they would start, what they would do with this case to start, how they would initially work with this family. And it was fascinating because they were each coming from their own place of how they would work with it. And um, that's where I feel, I feel the adoptee, if they've done their own work, and not every everyone in any of these positions has done their own work. Um, but if they have, they have the advantage of being the centerpiece. You can, you know, it really should be about the child. It You should take care of the birth parents. You should take care of the adoptive parents. They're all very important to the child. But the most important thing is the child and helping that child to progress. And um, And I think that's... And, you know, the other professionals, I was very lucky um, in, my, in my education at Harvard to have Eric Erickson as one of my professors. And he was, uh, you know, very famous and very wonderful. Yeah. And, and when I had him, he was uh, hard of hearing. He was much older and he couldn't speak. He couldn't lecture. So he would only have small groups of six students. And I fought my way into three different seminars that he did because uh, it was very hard to get in. He only took six people. Um, yeah. and, and I used to have these funny conversations with him. Uh, and he, I loved him. He was so great. I can't do his, I can't do his accent, his Austrian accent. But he, he would say, I said to him, Eric, you're the father of identity. And I'm working on identity and adoption. What can you tell me that will help me in my work? And he would throw his head back and laugh and say, Joyce, I'm the father of identity confusion. And um, because he never knew his father and all of his work was about his searching for his father. So we had great conversations about this. And it was it was he was a great professor for that reason. But he knew the place of the child. You know, he he was the child okay. in that story. Okay. Uh, so Joyce, there is another question. So, um, having been in this field so for long, what are your thoughts about where we are now? <sighs> well, you know, I know that many of you aren't in the United States, so it, it's hard to know where you are in 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 the situation you're in. Um, in the United States. Uh, what's yes, happened? Sorry, the, the question comes from uh, uh, two adoptees from Hawaii. Two from where? Hawaii. Hawaii. Uh, oh, okay. Um, in the <laughs> United States, what I see happening there is, uh, you know, in the recent years, international adoptions have dropped for good reasons. There was a lot of child trafficking, a lot of bartering, a lot of children ended up available for adoption because there was something to be gained from that. It wasn't necessarily the wish of their family. We know that from adoptees who have searched and found. Um, so I'm for many different reasons, but I think some of them very good. There was a great reduction in international adoptions. There also in recent years has been a reduction in infant 
adoptions. Um, that's shifting somewhat in the states because the uh, right to life movement, I mean, when there are babies available, there's adoption and there's a push for that. The other thing that has changed that is uh, more people can do donor situations or surrogacy situations. And so there are alternatives to adoption if you want to make a family. So I think adoption has uh, decreased uh, in the recent years, um, but what's, what's taken in its place is that foster care adoption is a way to move children out of the foster care system into families, which on the surface sounds like a really good idea because you want permanency for kids. You don't want them moving from place to place. Mm -hmm. Um, but many of them are really not available for adoption. Their families are still very involved. And unless you were going to do a very open arrangement, um, you would be cutting them off, mostly at older ages, from their family of adoption. So I think adoption's up in the air right now. I think, you know, it's, it's very difficult. In my area, because I've worked there for so, so long, and and now I work with people. I have a client in Israel. I have two clients in London. I have I have clients all over the world that that I talk to, um, and and all over the country, which is great because um, I think that it's it's nice to be able to provide a resource where, where some people don't have it and wherever they live. Um, but I think that what's important is for people to understand when a child says something to really listen. And if you get to the wrong therapist or the wrong help, they can move you away from listening to the child. Like, oh, that child is just talking about their birth parent because they're, you know, don't pay attention to that. But it's very important. We're about to, in the United States, we have Mother's Day coming up this weekend. And Mother's Day is fraught with drama for the adoptive family. Um, you know, I remember, that's the time when 12 year olds go and tell their parents, you're not my real parents because they're thinking about their birth mother or, you know, I mean, there are all kinds of acting outs that happen around that time because kids are really, you know, they're thinking it's not that they don't necessarily love their adoptive mother, but they know they have another mother and they're thinking about her as well. So, you know, to pay attention to that, even if it hurts you, as an adoptive parent, sometimes that's hurtful. You feel less than. You you have your own insecurities about not having given birth to that child. So it may make you feel a little worried. Um, but it's important to hear the child and to do whatever you can to give them the supports they need. Um, and I think that's really, really important. I think I lost yeah. the track of the real question. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. It's okay. And... Um, so about your activity, so I think, uh, I guess you've seen uh, and meet um, hundreds of adoptees. So because maybe they felt more uh, understood by you since you are an adoptee as well, because I feel more understood by my wife, for instance, <laughs> that she's an adoptee as well. I spend a lot of time. One of the things, I, I think that's wonderful. Um, I do a lot of couples work also. And um, adult adoptees, I have two right now who have searched and are in the midst of, of finding their birth family. And there's an affair-like quality to the search. You become obsessed. And uh, if your partner doesn't understand that, they're losing you emotionally during that period. So I do a lot of work helping the partner to understand what's going on and why the adoptee is acting the way they are. Just like we have to help parents understand, both birth and adoptive parents understand the adoptee, we have to help their partner who isn't adopted. And just because you're both adopted, you are I mean, I always say we're in the same book, but we're not on the same page. We all have our own unique story yeah. and our own feelings and our own upbringing that was different. So it's important to, to realize um, when I was training interns, I used to tell them, your story is a case study of one. It's your story. It doesn't mean everyone else gets it or feels that way. But there's something you do get that you can help to impart. 
Um, have you ever had uh, some uh, daughters or uh, sons of uh, adoptees? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've been very interested in that while my daughter was growing up because I shared everything. I was very open with her about everything. And she, um, I remember at one point, I, I knew my birth mother. I've known my birth family for about 45 years. So we go to Sunday dinner all the time. She's very close to her cousins and everything. But way back when she was little, she would say, tell me again who about your birth mother. And so I would tell her. And um, she was very close to my mom, my, her, my adoptive mother. So she, she would say, well, so she's my Nana too. And I would say, yeah, she's your Nana too. And um, she said, well, I don't like her. I, I don't like her at all because she gave you away. And that's a mean thing to do to a baby. So she had to, I, I had to do a lot of psychoeducation and help her to understand, you know, that she was, she was a teenager. She couldn't support me back in those days. It was right after the war. And she had to find a family that could take care of me. So she eventually understood. The funny thing is when she was in college, she, um, she took, she was studying in a graduate school. She was studying communications and she did, um, you had to give a 10 minute uh, speech that would convince everyone in the room of something. You had to be very powerful and convince them. And she convinced them that we should have open records, uh, access to the original birth certificate. And she did a great job. So, and yes, I see a lot of children of adoptees. And one of the things that I've noticed is if you, if the adoptee doesn't do their work, if they don't do what they need to do to integrate their past and their present, their child becomes adoptee-like. They have a lot of the same attributes and the same issues. If you don't give them the chance to understand that you're integrating things, they feel it's their job to do it. And so um, it's in the best interest of adoptees to do their homework um, before or when they have children. Yeah, yeah. because as you wrote in your book, um, adoption is not a fact that happens in your life, but it's not a snapshot uh, picture, but it's something moving, continuing yes. moving in, in evolution, right? And That's right. keep on going with our uh, children as well. That's right. That's right. So, and uh, someone is asking if you are planning another book. Oh, I, <laughs> I, absolutely. And you know what's really awful? I, I actually have three different books that are in process. And one of them is, a, is an update of the family of adoption. And the other two are different. Uh, one of them is a book for professionals and parents to understand more of, of what they need to know. Um, and here we are in a quarantine, and you would think I would be writing away and using this time usefully, but instead I'm watching Netflix. <laughs> I, I, I feel very lazy. I think, I think I'm going to, the next month, if we have to stay in longer and longer, I'm going to get to my writing, but I have not been very good. I've been avoiding mm -hmm. writing. <laughs> Too much to write. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, um, and another question is, uh, if you can talk uh, some, uh, some, uh, some more about how children of adoptees are affected by um, the adoption, yeah, by uh, parents' adoption. Well, you know that everyone comes with issues and challenges. Everyone. Ours are a little more specific and... Um, like I said, if you if you have done some work on yourself, it's very helpful. And that's true of any parent. I mean, whatever you haven't dealt with gets passed on to your children. And the way you parent, it, it's complicated for an adoptee because you have funny visions about how you should parent. Um, I think most adoptees wonder what it would be like to grow up in a family that was your root family where the parents who gave birth to you also raise you. And so a lot of adoptees don't really know what kinds of things would be different. 
and you know everyone has different parenting styles to a couple i mean each parent has different parenting styles so it's um it's hard to say what things get passed on to the child of an adoptee but there are things that do and i i think openness being able to talk about things being able to explain uh why you know i was a little overprotective when my daughter was very little um i we lived in the city and kids would go out and play ball in the street and i wouldn't let her play in the street be, until and i made this crazy rule i was always good at making it sound okay um i made a crazy rule that when she was tall enough so that people could see her over the car over the hood of the car she could walk out to the street but if they couldn't see her they might not stop and she she loved logic so she'd say oh okay and then she you know she'd understand why she couldn't go so i and it was really me being very overprotective because i think if you feel like children can be taken from you which happened to you um that it might happen to your child so there's a there's a funny feeling about that the other thing about children of adoptees if you haven't had the opportunity to meet your birth family then this child or these children are the only people in the entire world that are genetically related to you so that's a very powerful thing and so the way you relate to them and the way they relate to that uh, plays a role in your parenting and how you parent them it's it's very complex but i think the best thing is to talk about it to make sure you're you know discussing it and i i once once children are old enough, I mean, you you need to um, reframe things and put them in in words that make sense for their developmental stage. Uh, but they do need information, and that's something that many of us weren't given. Um, so it's it it makes it very clear that you need to be talking and explaining some things to the child about you and how why you're the way you are. And that that won't be exactly the same for them, but they may carry some of the same issues or feelings. Um, you know, I think that these are important things, and each case is different. So when I say these general things, they make no sense because each case, each family, each child is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sorry, am I may one thing, one question. I'd like to also ask your um, opinion. So, um, if I, I, I was um, an adopter or a, a teacher, I would like to write a book, a uh, guidebook for uh, adoption parents about school, right? How to, um, to uh, in order to uh, get more interest and give a guide to the teacher uh, how to um, teach and how to um, yeah, to teach to these students. Should I ask also the advice uh, to some adult adoptees in order to write this book, or it's not really recommended? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I, if I, I don't do, if so, if I don't do, why I don't? I, I I'm, I'm because I'm scared that the adoptees are too involved, and so so too much that they can write uh, actually uh, the proper things? Well, here, if I were to write that book, I'm very good at telling you how you should write a book, but I, I'm not good at finishing them. But if you were to write that book, which would be wonderful, first of all, I don't think you should tell teachers what they should do because they won't like that and they won't take it in. Mm. I think you should, uh, you know, give more examples of things like, for instance, and I don't know if this is true there, but in, in the U.S., uh, probably in the fourth grade, there's the family tree and you're supposed to draw a picture of your family tree. So for many children, adoptees included, that brings up a lot of feelings and worries and, and they feel it's not authentic because it's not really their family tree. So instead of saying what you should do, it might be good to say, you know, these are the these are the kinds of things that happen at different grades and stages that you might want to pay attention to um, when you're developing your curriculum. 
and when you're thinking about which books you're going to suggest that people read there uh, you know there is not uh, adoption is in every bible story every myth and every fairy tale it's a great story so it's in everything and all the good novels have some adoption piece to them so it's you know it's easy to assign some reading that will be you know evocative for the adoptee but also you have to realize that it is because they may have a hard time writing about it or talking about it because of that so just giving people some uh suggestions about what might happen and as far as introducing the adoptees i would ask different adoptees to tell a story tell a story about your first day of school tell a story about and then to just write the quote and to give the first name like you know laura um you know and then say something about her adoption and maybe her age or rough zone of when when she was adopted so that they just get the voice of the adoptee without getting uh any kind of sense that maybe they're for or against adoption because that's not the point of the book the point of the book is to listen to children to be aware of what is going on for them to realize that some things get in the way of learning and um some emotional things get in the way of learning i love my story that's in my book about the little boy who uh couldn't do math and um he meanwhile we played cards all the time in in our therapy sessions and he was brilliant he could hold all kinds of math in his head and when i asked him about it he said i don't like subtraction when they say subtract and take away it makes me sad now who would think of that but adoptees have funny you know triggers that really make them uh, you know distracted and it's not add it's just distraction because they're anxious and because these emotional issues are coming up so how do you help teachers it's not so much giving them a guidebook as giving them a foundation for understanding a framework for what some of the things a child might be going through at different stages i think that's important yes okay yeah uh joyce uh, there's a um a last question yeah you should you should know that the um, who are who is writing your the question is um she's a really big fan of you ah <laughs> that you know that that you can read all the all the comments that follow up on the on the post on the live yes <laughs> because i think that uh, maybe she had uh, she has other question to <laughs> she can email me or be in touch with me for sure afterwards yes, okay yeah. perfect so she's asking if uh, 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 for those of us interested and or working in this field what advice do you have general advice well i think um <laughs> it's very hard in this country to find uh training in adoption uh it's not integrated into your graduate schools in any way as a matter of fact a good friend uh who's a pediatrician uh she edited a book a few years ago that's a textbook for medical schools and it was the first one i mean this is ridiculous so many years later it was the first one to bring up issues of adoption and to help people in medical school to understand um and so i think it's very hard it's you have to self educate you have to do all the reading you can you have to try to find someone who can mentor you and who can supervise you in some way um it's uh really for the most part you're still sort of on your own uh there are more and more people which is great there are some very good facebook groups for um therapists who are adoptees and you know things of that sort Um but I think as far as getting your training it's really I think it's still very hard to do that because there aren't so many places and and certainly not in your graduate schools that give you what you need for that. So I think that's unfortunate and uh, it's something we have to change and you know I actually tried to change it but as I said you have to keep doing things over and over. A friend of mine uh Professor Gary Mallon at the Hunter Graduate School of Social Work we had a big federal grant back when there was money 
Um, and uh, he and I developed <coughs> developed a year long course. <coughs> excuse me. We developed a year long course uh, for adoption competency, and it was in New York. And it was once a month. People would come in on Thursday night, and we'd work Friday and Saturday and Sunday morning. And we wrote a whole curriculum, which anyone can have. And it was it lasted for about four years. And then we trained trainers, and they did it in other places. And there are some other groups that have since developed some trainings of that sort. So those can be, and I'm sure some of them are online. And more and more, they have to be. So I think that's good. Um, but the more you can get the training, the more you can get the mentoring, the more you can get the supervision. I met a, a lovely woman. I, I gave her your information. She's in Argentina and she is an adoptee and a psychologist. And we met at a conference and she has come to visit me and she shadowed me and, and stayed for a, a few days. And she calls me and we do consulting and supervision um, every once in a while when she needs it. And, you know, those kinds of, you can find people that you can, you know, connect to and get some support with. I think that's, that's really important, but it's a shame. It can't be organic. It's a shame. It's not part of more, um, more curriculum. So thank you very much, Joyce. Thank you. It has been a, a, a very pleasure for us. Yes. And uh, hope to see you very soon. It was wonderful to meet you. And I hope we can go out in the world and be out of jail soon so that we can, uh, you know, see each other. I, I love to come back to Italy. I, I, I told you I was there in Modena in Bologna doing some training a few years ago, and I had a wonderful time. And uh, maybe we one day we can plan a, a, a trip uh, to, to the U.S. That would be wonderful. Yeah. So. That would be wonderful. <laughs> Come, so. come when we have a different president, please. <laughs> okay. 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 So, thank you again, Joyce. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you very much. It was great to meet you. Take care. Yeah. Yeah. You Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay, so it has been uh, a great pleasure for yeah. us uh, to host uh, Joyce uh, yeah. and um, she said uh, a lot of things, of things. very yeah. important for, for us as adoptees, but I think uh, also for adopters yeah. and for um, who works in, uh, who work in, uh, in this field too. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think we we've seen today many perspectives, many uh, topics related to adoption. Uh, so that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we can um, say thanks uh, to everybody. Yeah. Who... To the yeah to the live and also who posted um, questions. If you have other questions, you can uh, post uh, and then uh, we can uh, uh, email to, to her. To but also, yeah, she told uh, her. She told. Uh, uh, she said uh, to to contact her uh, directly. She's really kind, so she was. And so, see you soon. Uh, next next week. Next week, yes, <laughs> next yes. week. Who <laughs> is this place? With another special uh, guest. Yes. So, have a nice week. Thank you.